My present research has to do a very interesting problem. The James Webb Telescope, Space Telescope, released date on the 11th of July, and they've seen something very interesting. They find they look, they're looking back to very high redshifts compared to the Hubble. The Hubble Space Telescope was 1.5 meter diameter. The James Webb is 6.5 meters diameter. Um, the James Webb looks, looks in the infrared. The Hubble can't do that. Only looks at the visible spectrum of light. So you need to look at the infrared to see the light height richness. So what they see is galaxies that are well formed with disk like galaxies, as you see, pictures. And they're massive, 10 to the power nine times the mass of the sun, a billion times the mass of the sun. And the question is, how do we get those, uh, those distances, redshifts of Z equal to 20? So there are also some models for how you grow galaxies and also the supermassive black holes at the centers of galaxies. Most galaxies have a big supermassive black hole. How can they get to these big masses in a short time? They've seen a galaxy that's 230 million years after the Big Bang. What a ride. Yeah, that was pretty epic, actually. <laughs> Dr. Moffitt has had a wide-ranging career over many decades and has seen all of the changes that have happened in that time in cosmology and astrophysics. He got his start under Fred Hoyle, who was a real firebrand in the cosmology community. And so he has this really deep affinity for thinking outside of the box. And he's concerned about the James Webb data, and he's looking into possibilities for how to amend the standard cosmology. And we had the chance to talk to him about everything from tired lights to maybe the Big Bang didn't happen at all. Alfin. Yeah, Hans Alfin, uh, magnetohydrodynamics, all of our favorite topics. And it was just fascinating to speak with somebody who's been at it so long and has such an open mind. I think you guys are going to really like this one. If you like what we do, drop us a line in the comments, uh, tell your friends, share the episodes wherever you can. If you really, really like what we do, we have a Patreon. We take PayPal donations. If you have crypto, we can probably figure that out as well. Everything is down in everything is down in the description below. We would love to have your support. We really need your support because right now we can only put out one of these episodes a week, and I believe that if we get our Patreon budget up a little bit higher, we might be able to get some help. Really, honestly, hire some help with the editing, and we have tons of these conversations just piling up on our computer, and we can't possibly get to more of them than we're doing right now. You know, we have day jobs, we work, uh, this isn't bringing us much, no income really, it's all going back into the program. So if you can just give like a couple dollars a month, jump over on Patreon and throw it at us because if enough of you do that, I really think that we can up the output of this podcast. The scientific revolution starts now. There are two ways of doing physics research, of scientific research. One is to stay within the box, so to speak. Inside the box, you're doing standard accepted physics. And uh, it's called mainstream physics. I've done a lot of that. You, you publish papers where you do calculations. And you fit data, and nobody gets too excited about it. Then there's physics done outside the box. 
you have to go outside the box to really make change in physics, to progress physics. Uh, you have to become a bit of an iconoclast. So physics is conservative. Science is conservative, which it has to be. And uh, you only change the paradigm when you actually have to. And normally, what happens is you have an idea, you have a hypothesis, and uh, you then find a framework, mathematical framework, for the idea and hypothesis. That's your theory. And then you have to test the theory experimentally. And if it fails the test, you throw away and start again. And another idea. And that's how it progresses. So um, there's also an issue of predictions. <coughs> when does a theory finally, a paradigm finally take over? And it takes over when theory makes a prediction that no other model can, can uh, be consistent with, cannot fit the data available. That's how it works. So my paradigm work is outside the box, and uh, it takes time to get people to accept change, because Textbooks have been written about this, whatever the standard model is, and people have to, they're comfortable with that. And courses are taught to universities, it all gets in, entrenched. And uh, you come along and say, well, I disagree with this, and uh, such and such and such, and uh, I'm going to make a change. When did you first realize that there was a change necessary? Is this something that you've been thinking about your whole life? Um, well, I tend to be, I, what I do is, as I said, I've done a lot of standard physics because I graduate students over the years. I've had something like 30 odd graduate students do doing PhDs, and um, you need to put them on a project. And you have to make sure you choose a project which is somewhat safe for their sake, because they need a PhD, they need a career. So mostly the projects are chosen to be safe. You do a calculation within standard physics, whatever it is, and uh, you get results. And uh, you send it to a journal for publication. Referees are happy. It's something they understand, they're comfortable with, and it gets published. So I've done a lot of that. I once had as many as, as six graduate students working at once under my supervision. <coughs> also, I've had postdocs, postdoctoral fellows. Same kind of situation. So on the other hand, when I on my own work, I want to go beyond that box, outside the box, because I want to try to make a new physics something important. <laughs> and um, I tend to look at standard models mainstream and say. What if I do this instead? Uh, how far can I get with doing that? And uh, it all depends on fitting the data and so on. And uh, progress is slow. Referees get upset. You have to learn to take the heat in the kitchen. Like that. Otherwise, you just you have, you should get out, okay, and go back to your standard physics. 
but this was something that you were always playing with on the side in addition to working within the confinements of the standard model you you were also toying with these projects on the side sort of like a, a sort of like a side project that you would play with is that how you would see it So that means you got to be trying a lot of things at once. A lot of different models have to be in the air. And for for I mean one of your one of your models is this variable speed of light. And so when you I said one of your models is the variable speed of light model. And when the variable speed of light model, as far as I understand it, says that in the early universe, there's a period of time where light moved much faster than it does today. And that's necessary in order to account for the appearance of the universe. And you can't really go back and test that, right? It's not like you can put it in a box and recreate the early universe and say, okay, well, it moved faster here and it moved slower here. And this model is correct. And so when you put this model out into the world and people begin to evaluate it and they begin to discuss it, what decides whether or not the model is is accepted? Because it could just as easily be something, it could be some other phenomenon that doesn't require the speed of light to change. Perhaps our perhaps our understanding of the of the universe isn't as accurate as we think it is. Well, <coughs> the the standard model <coughs> for the initial beginnings of the universe is so called inflation. And inflation this takes place in general you accept general relativity and special relativity. And uh, the problem is that that there's something called the horizon cosmology. And uh, it's as far as you can see, get visible light coming to you. So it turns out that, that when you look at the data, so-called micro cosmic microwave background data, the temperature is the same at great distances between, say, two points A and B. And it's the same, it's uniform. So when you look at the beginning of the universe, you can't understand how this can be, because light and speed travels at its measured value. And you can't connect what's happening to a temperature at A or temperature at B the causal way because of the limit of the speed of light. So what you do is you assume at the beginning of the universe fractions of seconds after the Big Bang that uh, the universe, universe expands exponentially fast. It's inflation. And uh, it happens for certain fractions of seconds. And then, because of this huge expansion, you can now connect all these different points in space time and then show why the temperatures are all the same at all these points. So, <clears throat> that's inflation. So, then inflation lasts for some seconds. Then it stops at uh, the end of inflation, 
and you go into what's the standard part of cosmology. So it solves the initial value problems of cosmology. It also predicts that the universe is spatially flat. Uh, the data says that this is the case to within a few percent. Uh, it also solves the problem of monopoles. You don't see so-called electrical monopoles, even though they're predicted. This ex explains how you get rid of them. And uh, also, fluctuations in space-time uh, very early in the early universe. The inflation expands the wavelength of the fluctuation from a very small object fluctuation to something that's macroscopic. And these macroscopic fluctuations uh, of the seeds of galaxies and stars, which began to form about 400 million years out of the Big Bang. Okay, that's reflection. So I come along and think, well, if there's some other way of doing this. So it's obvious. Fractions of seconds after the Big Bang, speed of light is very large. And uh, we're talking about 10 to the minus 32 seconds after the Big Bang, 10 to the minus 36 seconds after the Big Bang. So there's a huge increase in speed of light. Then it goes through what's called a phase transition, the light speed, and becomes the standard value that we measure. So that solves the horizon problem, it solves the fact that all of these measurements of well, temperatures, different points are the same because the speed of light can get reach all of them. <laughs> it's, it's a trivial idea. But then you have to convert it into a theory. So we know from special relativity that the light has a certain fixed constant speed. And uh, with, with respect to any inertial reference frame. And this is true, it's measured. So I have to break that symmetry, it's a symmetry. It's called Lorentz symmetry. I have to break the Lorentz transformation symmetry of special relativity. And I do this fractions of seconds after the Big Bang. And um, there's a way of doing that. So physics was different in in this very early moment. Is the solution? Is it? Yes. So how how can so, physics be different? Well, it's a different model. You see, because it solves the same problems. It's just a different model, different assumptions about the physics, fundamental physics. Inflation also says that physics was different too, from what I understand. Mm. So the the upshot of all this is that that um, you're never going to measure something 10 to the minus 40 seconds after the Big Bang. In fact, you're never going to measure the Big Bang. It's just out of the question. <clears throat> so um, the question is, what happens? What consequences do these two models have in the later universe? That's what you're looking for. Now, you're, I wanted to ask you, before we get too deep into your theory, you worked under Fred Hoyle for your actual graduate degree, is that correct? That's right. And Fred Hoyle wasn't a fan of the Big Bang in general, is that correct? He had a stationary uh, or a steady state theory. Uh, yes. Which... Is interesting because if you don't have the Big Bang, you don't have all of these problems associated with, with the early moments of the Big Bang. Well, uh, the Big Bang was based on what's called the perfect cosmological principle. Not only is it, is the unif doesn't the universe look the same in every spatial direction, 
but also the same at every time. This is steady state universe. And uh, Bondi, Hoyle, and they, they were the main promoters of this. And um, it was proved to be experimentally not correct because uh, radio telescopes discovered that the quasars were very distant and they changed their structure the farther back you go in time, which is not consistent with steady state model. Steady state model, they should always be the same. So that killed it. <laughs> How does how does the quasars change their their behavior as you go farther back in time? The fact is that space time is expanding, and the galaxies are not moving away from one another. They're moving with space time expansion of space time. And to to clarify, the expansion of space time is derived indirectly from the redshift. Is that correct? That's correct. The farther away expansion of the object is in the expanding space time, the bigger the redshift. So the redshift is, is proportional to distance. So the more redshift, the more distance. So when you go back in time, um, the universe has to be more dense. And it keeps getting more dense until time t equal to zero, where by classical general relativity, there's a singularity. So there's all sorts of evidence that supports this. There's been news recently of people who claim that the Big Bang is wrong, it never happened. It's been in the news. And so uh, this cannot be correct. Well, so there's there's two pillars that I'm I'm well aware of for the Big Bang, which is the cosmic microwave background and this universal redshift. Though it's not it, the redshift is not universal because there are anomalous objects that aren't redshifted in the appropriate way, right? Wasn't it uh, was it quasars that are pointed towards us that Halton Arp was talking about? Yeah, there's there's also this new James Webb data with these hyper redshifted. Uh, galaxies that seem like they're older than the Big Bang. And uh, yeah, there's some interesting developments in this. But yeah, I think you're right that the two pillars are the, are the red, sh the, what's called the uh, Hubble relationship. Is that what it's called? Uh, which is yes, this, this redshift, redshift distance relationship. And then also it's the CMB data. And so my question is this, like, We're let's say... Right, because these are we these are interpretations of cosmological phenomena. We see something and we interpret it, and it's it's all built upon foundational principles that we've been using for the last hundred years. Right, so the idea of light being redshifted over the course of great distances and that relating to time has to do with the fact that there isn't a physical. There isn't a physicalist model for light. And if you don't have a physical model for light, then it makes sense that your redshift would be accounted for by time. But is it possible to develop a material explanation that could have a physical explanation for the redshift that has to do with friction over great distances or something about the difficulty of traveling so far that creates the redshift? Well, there's something called tired light hypothesis. Yeah, but that's kind of the light just gets tired as it as the visible light comes to as it travels through great distances. But that theory doesn't work. It it doesn't fit the data, the cosmological data. The standard expansion hypothesis is that uh, the wavelength goes becomes redder due to the expansion the universe and uh, th there's a lot of data that backs this up 
What is the what are the greatest arguments against tired light? Do you do you cu- well? From what I understand, there's there's many different tired light hypotheses. I mean, hmm. there's tons of papers about it. Everybody has a different version of it, so they're all going to be a different mathematical angles on trying to make it work. By the way, I should just say that my uh, present research has to do a very interesting problem. The James Webb Telescope, Space Telescope, released data on the 11th of July. And they've seen something very interesting. They find they look, they're looking back to very high redshifts compared to the Hubble. The Hubble Space Telescope was 1.5 meter diameter. The James Webb is 6.5 meters diameter and the James Webb looks, looks in the infrared. The Hubble can't do that. Only looks at the visible spectrum of light. So you need to look at the infrared to see the light high richness. So what they see is galaxies that are well formed with disk like galaxies, as you see pictures. And they're massive, 10 to the power 9 times the mass of the sun, a billion times the mass of the sun. And the question is, how do we get those uh, those distances, redshifts of Z equal to 20? So there are also some models for how you grow galaxies and also the supermassive black holes at the centers of galaxies. Most galaxies have a big supermassive black hole. How can they get to these big masses in a short time? They've seen a galaxy that's 230 million years after the Big Bang. Yeah, we're meeting with uh, the guy who took that picture tomorrow morning, Steve Finkelstein, at uh, Austin. So we see dinosaur fossil prints quite recently because the water is disappearing places that are 13, 20 million years old. But the, the 113, 200 million years old, sorry. So how can you form a galaxy fully formed in 200 million years? Mm. Right. So there's a lot of uh, panic about that. Anyway, that's what I'm working on at present. So yeah, I think that that's a really interesting question. What are your what are your thoughts? Because that that's an alarming. When I read that, I just I laughed out loud. It just seemed beyond belief that a galaxy could have formed in two hundred million years, especially because right now we're working on an episode for our other channel where we're talking about Earth two hundred million years ago, and so I've been thinking a lot about what two hundred million years looks like, and it's you know a flash in the pan. Yeah, because the sun, the solar system is four and a half billion years old. Okay, we're talking about two hundred million years. So, and a galaxy has a lot of suns bang. in it. <laughs> yeah. you can't form galaxies at the Big Bang. Anyway, so the so I'm working with that. So what I'm doing is applying my modified gravity theory called scalar tensor vector gravity. I call it MOG, Modified Gravity. And uh, there's been a lot of papers published on that. In fact, I'm just refereeing a paper now for the Astrophysical Journal um, for Chinese physicists who published a long paper about my MOG black hole. I have a MOG black hole. And um, so if I do that, then the strength of gravity can be increased in the early universe, very early universe. And this could possibly solve the problem. Otherwise, I've been thinking about this for two years. I've been thinking that this would happen with the James Webb. (laughs) It has. And uh, I've been preparing for it mentally. (laughs) And uh, I can't, it's a very difficult problem. I just, 
I keep banging away at it and I do the standard physics and I can't solve it. But why not? This is very exciting. Well, okay, look. We know that in the past there have been eras of science that go through periods of epicycles where there is a theory or a model that everybody really likes and the way that people chip away at it is that they progressively add more and more modifications to the foundation to give the results that are necessary. And the the Big Bang is the theory in this case that needs the modifications. You have to continuously add stuff to it to make it work. And I know that steady state has been washed away because of various problems, but is it is it possible to go back and revisit the reasons for which it was washed away and reevaluate them and come to different conclusions based off of what we know now? Because it seems like it's possible for science to get into a cul-de-sac and then to have to, you know, awkwardly back out and then get back onto the main road. It ha- it's happened in the past. Why is it not possible that it's happening here now? Well, it is possible. I think the... Uh, let me explain the standard cosmology very quickly. Mm. It's based on uh, general relativity, Einstein gravity. It's correct. It's based on the uh, fact that the u- uniform f- f- universe looks... Uh, homogeneous, uniform in all directions. Uh, at a certain distance, close by in the universe, there are inhomogeneities, galaxies and stuff. And um, the Big Bang. Okay. Also, it only works if you invent dark matter, and dark energy. Dark matter because stars and galaxies are moving too fast, so you have to slow them down so they don't just fly off. And galaxy, galaxy clusters, big clusters of galaxies, they have to be stabilized. And therefore, you need. So, how do you solve this problem? It's either gravity or more matter. If you throw in more matter, it strengthens gravity. You modify gravity, it strengthens gravity. Both do the same. So I went the way of modified gravity because I'm curious to know how the standard model now, the dark matter model, how robust it is. No one's ever te- to test it, detected dark matter. They've been trying for half a century. Billions of dollars. Just keep going. And um, they should keep looking for it. But in my opinion, they won't find it. <laughs> and uh, so I'm putting my money on, I'm doubling down, as you say, gambling, <laughs> on, on dark matter and on the modified gravity, my mark. My mark is just a theory, by the way, and it still has to be fully tested. However, there's been many, many publications from all the publications since I published this, my last version of Mark, which was 2006, 2006, um, there have been 100, 200 papers. And uh, in particular, which now been established, it fits galaxy data, cluster data, cluster of galaxies data, uh, it fits cosmological data, it fits what's called gravitational lensing, and uh, so it fits the data. Does it mean it's correct? I don't know, because the dark matter can compete with it. But the problem with dark matter is it's not a theory. Mm. It's just a phenomenological Paradigm. It's a hypothesis, right? Like, if it was true, it, it might work for a theory, but... What, what, di- what differentiates dark matter from an epicycle? 
That's a very good question. I said, that's exactly it. Let's get back to Ptolemaic astronomy. Uh, Ptolemy, the Greek astronomer. Uh, Two hundred eighty, three hundred eighty. Um, the Earth was the center of the universe. To Copernicus, uh, to say no, it's heliocentric. The sun is at the center. So this took a thousand years, and the Ptolemaic astronomy works very well because of the epicycles and all sorts of other. They had to show why, explain how when you observe planets moving, they suddenly take retrograde motion. They go to retrograde orbit. This takes several epicycles. So my opinion is the dark matter is, is one big epicycle. <laughs> And dark energy is also a mystery. That, that makes perfect sense because humans want to see themselves at the center of everything. And I wonder if the Big Bang isn't equally anthrocentric, where we're trying to make a birth and death because that's what a human life experiences. I'm not sure if you... Do you remember the Lemaitre quote? About the, you remember it, it better than me. There was uh, so George Lemaitre who proposed the Big Bang. At I read this at at one point, and I if if anybody can pull this up, it'd be great. I think but it was a letter he, to the Pope. No, I'm not maybe, sure. Go on, go on. He 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 basically said that he proposed a birth because the idea of eternity was unfathomable to human minds, and I. I it's hard for me to feel like our attachment to a birth and our ability to take the data that we see and to kind of paste it onto this egg that is the beginning isn't just an affectation of our desire to see our own path reflected in the arc of the universe. Because, so there, there is data that supports the theory, but... It strikes me that, like, even Einstein spoke of space-time as being a kind of ether theory. Like, if you go and you read his Leyden address, he talks about it being a, uh, he calls it a non-kinematic ether that is responsible for the mechanics of, of what we observe. And so, it strikes me that by treating things as being non-material and as being inexplicable and as being spooky, we are creating a situation where we purport to be able to put the ice cube back together, so to speak. So if you have an ice cube in a dish and it melts, it seems like what we're doing is we're doing the equivalent of saying, well, I can tell you where every molecule in that ice cube was before it melted. and it paints us as being wise and greatly important and incredibly able, but I'm not 100% sure that it's, it's true. Just from a, meta just fr from a purely metaphysical standpoint. Right? Well, a lot of what we do in science is... is uh, we, we tend to take an anthropomorphic point of view. <laughs> and and uh, a lot of it's uh, sociological and psychological. So the uh, development of physics, astronomy, was based on much on religious belief. And uh, we know what happened to Galileo and people were burned at the stake and so on. Well, the father of the Big Bang was a priest, for, for God's sake. Well, like, it's, it's a belief, okay? It's up there. It's models. Well, all these are, we're talking about models. 
and uh, sociology comes into it. So it took a thousand years before we ac accept the fact that, that the earth is not the center and all, that this, the earth is not moving. That's what they would say. Church would not accept, the Roman Vatican Church would not accept the fact the earth was not, was moving. <laughs> it was static. And uh, Galileo got himself into trouble with that and others. So uh, now we rely much more on data because in the when back in the fifties, the back in the twenties, thirties, forties, fifties, cosmology was not a science really, it was just mainly mathematics. There wasn't all that much data available. And since then there's been an enormous amount of data collected because of Hubble, Hubble Space Telescope, and also because of the new data coming out from James Webb which will have great influence. So we're beginning, we now think we really have data, we can decide what's correct and what's not, as far as the, the uh, evolution of the universe. But what's interesting is it's essentially the same theory that's being propped up that was developed before all of that data was available. Like when they came up with the Big Bang, they thought that the galaxy was the, the entirety of the universe. They didn't even know there was other galaxies. Well, people didn't like the fact that the universe began at a finite time. This has relived religious implications. Okay. Well, Lemaitre at some point had to ask the Pope to... I was against it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Lemaitre had to ask the Pope to stop talking about how great his theory was. The Pope was just always on and on about how wonderful the Big Bang was, and Lemaitre had to send him a letter to be like, hey, could, it's not good for the theory for you to keep saying how great it is. Well... I'm paraphrasing. Uh, <laughs> actually, the, the original idea of a Big Bang was due to the Metra, who was a Catholic priest, 1927, yep. his famous paper, the Metra. And uh, the, the church went along with it eventually. Oh, the church loved it, actually. Yeah, the, the church loved it right away. Yeah, that's what I think that's what Nasti is trying to say, is that the, La Metra had to write the Pope and say, stop saying you like it so much because it's making me look bad. It, make, it makes it look like it's a religious theory, but in fact it is a scientific theory, so maybe perhaps curb it your... It is a scientific theory. Oh, sure, 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 sure. But he was saying that he didn't. The, the Pope was too complimentary in public about the theory, and it was making it hard for it to to be taken seriously as a scientific theory by virtue of that. Well, he should, because it is a scientific theory. No? So I, I hope that he agrees. <laughs> it's, I mean, my when the theory was developed there wasn't the redshift data yet there was there was i see it yeah, was exclusively Hubble, redshift at it, first yeah. it was just the redshift and the redshift data comes from this not lack of material basis for light so is it is it possible that our understanding of why light is redshifted is incorrect like can we go back farther and look at, at no it's it's cool. It's, it's, it's very simple physics, actually. It's, it's correct. I don't think this can be uh, objected to. Also, it has consequences in the actual growth of galaxies, stars, and the whole history of uh, the Big Bang back to the... But if you're comfortable with changing it. physics at the moments of the... After, in the few moments after the Big Bang, why, why couldn't you be comfortable with changing the physics of light at great distances. Could you repeat that? Sure. If, if we're comfortable with modifying the basic laws of physics 
at some moment in time, say at the moment, the instance after the Big Bang, if we're comfortable with modifying physics, why aren't we comfortable with modifying the way that light behaves at great distances? I see. Um, what are the distances we measure? I have to say, redshift of 20, say uh, 200 million years out of the Big Bang. I'm not willing to change our electromagnetic theory for that. I'm sure it's correct. Maxwell's equations and so on. That's, it's all based on Maxwell's theory and, and experiment, electromagnetic experiments, which I believe in. The one, the one possibility to solve the, the uh, distant galaxy problem, James Webb, is to extend the age of the universe I've been thinking about that. That used to be a popular idea some 50, 60 years ago. Well, I can almost guarantee that's going to happen. I mean, especially when they build an even bigger telescope and find even older galaxies. At some point, they're going to have to extend it. I mean, I, I could see them extending it for another just five, ten generations of telescopes before somebody is like, wait, I, I think this just doesn't make sense anymore. I have a question about redshift. No, but the, oh, go ahead, go ahead. I'll, I'll ask it later. I was just going to say that the problem is that when you change one thing, like extending age of the universe beyond 13.8 billion years, which is now the established age, is you, you start changing something else. <laughs> and that something else causes trouble with data. And then that change changes something else again. I think, oh, that, but that, now that isn't working. So it's not, it's, it's like a big jigsaw puzzle. Mm. And you're trying to put the pieces in. If you put the wrong piece in, everything starts looking wrong. I guess so I just feel it's like it's modified it's electromagnetism. Yeah, modified electromagnetism doesn't seem like a greater sin to me than modified gravity. It's just, you're, you're just changing basic physics under some special conditions. Like they both are okay. trouble. They're both troubling for sure. Um, but... I, I just, you don't modify electromagnetism. I'm modifying gravity. Sure, but why why is it acceptable to modify gravity but not to modify electromagnetism is I think what Shiloh is asking. Ah, because okay. The reason one reason is that gravity is forty orders of magnitude, ten to the power of forty times weaker than the electric force electromagnetism, magnetic force. It's very weak, and therefore it's, it's not as easy to talk about as electromagnetism. We do electromagnetic experiments all the time. It, it always works out correctly. When I give a course on, on electromagnetism for undergraduates, I can clearly state this experiment proves this, that experiment proves that. You do the experiment over and over, you always get the same ones. But gravity, it's not so easy. But gravity is really reproducible too. I can drop a ball on Earth or I can, you know, do different GPS experiments and I, I can measure the even the precision of, of relativity, of, of general relativity or, or Newtonian gravity. It's very reproducible in the laboratory. Yeah, My well, question is, that, so I, I, it is very reproducible in the laboratory. And so to get to the, the laboratory, why is it not possible to create a laboratory where you could test to see if light traveling over great distances becomes redshifted? Right, because that's the question. Well, you need 14 billion light years. Well, what ah. I'm saying, but the, the, it's redshifted by, by massive quantities at 14 billion light years. And so I'm saying, what is the smallest distance that you could do an experiment over to see if light is redshifted over that distance without a Doppler effect? Is that a possible experiment, or is because no. now we have we I mean it's we have possible. we have satellites that are that are that are located at great distances from each other. Is it mm. is it still too close? Too close. You have to go to millions of light years. <laughs> millions of light years. So 
gravity is very well tested in a lab, obviously. It's Newton's law. Gravitational constant times the mass of the source times the test mass divided by the square of the distance. It's correct. <laughs> and did Newton's law of work all the way out to uh, the general relativity for the solar system produces small corrections. For example, the famous correction is that, uh, that Mercury, the closest planet to the sun, uh, it's, it's so it point of closest approach to periast to perihelion, all orbits in a rosetta shape. It's not a closed ellipse. And the effect is called the perihelion shift of Mercury. The effect in, for general relativity is less than a percent. But that less than a percent changed the whole business because Newton can't fit it. And uh, shows you the small details. But you see how difficult it is. <laughs> when you go to galaxies, we've known that classes of galaxies since the, the Swiss astronomers, Zwicky, 1933, showed that the, the classes of galaxies is not realized. It's not stable if you just take into account the known mass, ordinary mass, due to protons. And so therefore we invent dark matter already then. People didn't take much, pay much attention to it then, but that's when it started. So general relativity fails. It failed. And they should invent dark matter, which has never been detected. And and that's the that's the problem, right? Whereas you you have theories that fit that fit in one place, but they fail in other places. And what we do is in, it, it's very very hard to come up with a new theory because theories are hard. Explaining how things work is one of the most difficult endeavors. You can you can put somebody in front of all of the data. You can put a, a, a hundred people in front of the exact same data and maybe less than one of those people will be able to actually tell you how it fits together into that jigsaw. And then exactly as you're saying, when you have a jigsaw that is not just physics or not just you know, the, the galactic rotation problem, but it has to do with everything. Everything has to be modified. You would have to have everyone come together in some sort of Congress and be willing to consider what would it look like if we changed this, right? So with, with something like modifying gravity, you're saying that it doesn't change too many other things because you can modify it without adding the epicycle. But there are... You don't change the solar system. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, exactly. Fit. Exactly. And so like, what would it take for people to come together and to start playing with the idea that perhaps the data that we have that supports the Big Bang wasn't interpreted correctly. Not because they're like, hey, we're dead certain and we're planting the flag here, but what would it take for the greatest minds in physics to come together to be like, okay, well, what if? What if it is wrong? Could we gather our minds to see a new way to fit the jigsaw puzzle together? Because... I don't know if you know, but there are puzzles like this. You can buy brain teaser jigsaw puzzles that you can fit together in multiple ways. And the, there's only one correct way, but you can still get something that fits. It just doesn't show the real picture. And so is, is there any will to do something like that, especially among emeritus professors and people that have been banging their heads against this for a long time to just get together and dream? Well, we're back to the fact that physics is conservative. I repeat, it has to be. So, how do you fit as a jigsaw piece? It's called the distant galaxy. If this whole the data holds up, by the way, James Webb Telescope, there's a galaxy that's been observed, which is well shaped. 
is as massive, with billion solar masses, as a disc shape, well formed, smooth, at 230 million years after the Big Bang. This is your jigsaw piece. Okay. How do you explain this? So you have to fit it into the Big Bang picture. But the problem is if you try to solve it, you start screwing up something else. <laughs> and then you screw up that and that has a, it has a, it's, it's, it's not easy. I'm not saying that it's easy, but I would love to see a group of physicists that are interested in playing with it, right? Not a fundamentally. Fundamentally, right? Not assigning their career credentials to it, not saying, you know, this is how it must be and we're going to prove it, but to just take the greatest minds of science and to put them to 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 see if they can play and come up with a different picture of the jigsaw puzzle that maybe doesn't have the Big Bang, because maybe the Big Bang did happen, and maybe we'll be able to reconcile all of this data and have it fit, but why not have a spirit of play to see, you know, so so toss, the, 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 scramble the jigsaw? Maybe there's another solution besides tired light, you know? Yeah, and it seems like there's not really a will for that, because you talk to people and everyone... All of these physicists that we speak to are very much certain that the Big Bang happened, there's no question, there's no other way to explain it, dark matter is fine, we're just going to keep adding stuff, don't worry about it. 200 million year galaxies after the Big Bang, that's fine, things changed. Like Even if they find ones that are before the Big Bang, they'll keep moving the date back for a while. How far can they move it back before someone is like, hey... Let's try something different other than the Big Bang. Yeah, because we, we know that you can keep this going for a thousand years. Like, we know. The, the, the point is that uh, the Big Bang data, there's a lot of data. We know there's a lot of correct. redshift data. After over and over observations. So when you start changing the Big Bang picture, which is going way back to the beginning. So we have today... And we have the uh, James Webb Telescope in time, okay? And then we have what's called recombination, and and uh, we get into radiation dominated, just photons, and so on. And the data, a piece of data I can fit. And these alternative, alternative to the Big Bang don't fit that data. At this point, because they don't get much attention, right? I mean, literally everyone is working on a Big Bang Theory, inside of the Academy at least. I just, I wonder if that, beca if it became apparent that the, that the data, you couldn't reconcile the redshift data. If we find galaxies that are older than the Big Bang, you know, there are reports of Z30 uh, clusters and so forth. I, I don't know if they'll hold up over time, but let's say we find things that are older than the Big Bang. People will try to explain that and move the Big Bang, but at some point, the tension will become... There's already a tension between this redshift and the CMB, from what I understand. At some point, this might become untenable, and new possibilities will need to be examined. Well, yeah. The, 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 the point I'm making is that the basic structure of the Big Bang, I think, will probably stay, but there are some could be some serious changes as to how we do it. But why does the basics... So if you... Like, let's... Like, let's say that it is possible to modify electromagnetic theory in a way that doesn't break everything and simply creates a different account of the redshift, right? The redshift is not indicative of the fact that everything is moving away from us. It's something else. And that doesn't break all of physics. It's just a reimagining of what the redshift means. And let's... Well, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Sorry, should be interrupted. <laughs> of course. Um, the, the Nobel Prize winner, Alfen, Alfen, Swedish cosmologist, physicist, he won the Nobel Prize because he... Excuse me. He uh, claimed 
that is electromagnetic turbulent electromagnetic properties are important for cosmology. And he invented something called plasma cosmology. And he claimed that that instead of the Big Bang, that the plasma cosmology picture where electromagnetic waves, electromagnetic interactions played a, a very important role, should replace the Big Bang. But data showed that this simply couldn't work. It doesn't work. You check it. There's no way you can make it work. So his theory was discarded after he won the Nobel Prize. He won the Nobel Prize for correct physics, okay? But this was a, his uh, outside-the-box stuff. <laughs> a lot of stuff outside the box is wrong, <laughs> mostly. But, but just because he was wrong about it doesn't mean that somebody else wouldn't have a different idea. That It might not be no, plasma I, cosmology, but it might be... I'm always open to ideas. Yeah. So by the cosmology. way, we could, the, I would like to shift to something else I'm doing. Um, I've been studying particle physics. I do cosmology, gravitation, and uh, these entail astrophysics, astronomy. Um, so that's in part of my modified gravity research. Then I do cosmology, as explained. Then I do particle physics. So <clears throat> in the last three or four years, I've expanded on work that I invented, some papers, I, ideas I invented. I had, to re, I had to redo quantum field theory. Quantum field theory is, is the basis of um, particle physics standard model. Uh, the particle physics consists of quarks, and leptons, and electrons, protons, and so on. And uh, so in quantum field theory, the whole of the standard model of particle physics is based on being able to do what's called renormalization theory. Because when you do calculations in particle physics with standard quantum field theory, you get infinities. And you can't have infinities. So you devised a way of cancelling the infinities. This is called renormalization theory. And from what I understand, renormalization theory is the process of taking the quantum and bringing it to the macro scale in a way that reflects real behavior. And it's a mathematical transformation of averaging the very, very small into progressively larger and larger groups until you can treat them mathematically in an appropriate way. Is that, does that sound right? Yeah, it, 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 we're just dealing with elementary particles. Protons, electrons, quarks, so elementary part. The, the smallest thing you can get to when you go down in size to look at atoms and beyond. <coughs> so I come along and say, okay, I can construct a quantum field theory. Well, I don't have these infinities. I published the first paper in 1990, Physical Review. Then I published a long paper with collaborators. Richard Woodard, uh, Dan Evans, and Klepper uh, in Physical Review, 1991, where we did all of this for co what's called quantum electrodynamics. That's the quantizing of the electromagnetic field, classical field. And uh, papers we published a lot over the years. So eventually I came to, so the, for the standard model, there are three parts. There's the strong force, there's the weak force, and the electromagnetic force, three basic forces. And then there's the gravity force, which we don't know how to put in with the other three at present. So for the strong force, electromagnetic force, 
the uh, renormalization works because the infinite renormalization cancel infinities because uh, the particle that transfers the force between two electrons, for you say, electromagnetism, is the photon. The photon has a zero mass. The force, the particle that transfers the force for strong interactions, quarks interacting, keeping the nucleus together, is the so-called gluons. They glue the quarks together. They have zero mass. So you zero mass, you're okay. But for the weak force, so-called electroweak, where you combine the weak and the electromagnetic force, the, the masses are not zero. They're heavy. And so you've got a problem. So what they did was standard model consists of saying, let's start the theory with all the masses zero because then I can do this infinite renormalization. Okay. So where do the masses come from? They come from a spontaneous symmetry breaking, so-called Higgs, Peter Higgs physicist. And uh, it's done in such a way that you keep this infinite renormalization. But there are problems with doing that for electro week. Technically, you won't get into. So I come along and say the following. I say, I can formulate the electric weak theory, keeping the mass as big as they are, not putting them to zero, and break the symmetry in a different way. It's not a, there's a so-called symmetry, gauge symmetry, which is broken. And that's what I do. And it turns out that for neutrinos, you say electrically, neutral, very light particles, neutrinos, which are the second most abundant particles after the photons in the universe. They, uh, there's a big problem with them and, uh, because the standard model doesn't work as far as the infinite renormalization is concerned. So I published papers recently on this. I'm publishing another paper the process of publishing your paper. This is not a popular thing to do because everybody accepts the other model. So I have a different model. I come along and say, I don't agree with this. This is the way it should be. And uh, I can describe the neutrinos better than you can. And people agree with this, by the way. So, that's my other activity. Can I um, ask you something really fundamental about all of this? What is a what are these forces? They, it sounds like magic to me. Like what is a how does a force work? Like how do these how do they materially bind something together? It it seems like it's just a ghost or something. Um well just take two electrons. And, uh, <coughs> the force between them is, is called the Coulomb force, after the invented by the physicist Coulomb. And uh, magnetism is a magnet, positive, negative, poles. And that was started by Faraday, physicist Faraday. And Mac Maxwell put it together, okay, to Maxwell's equations. And uh, for the two electrons, the Coulomb force, which is a one divided, it's an inverse square force, like gravity, one of our square, between two electric charges. And in quantum field theory, that is described by the exchange between the two electrons of a photon. The photon carries the force. And I can prove this experimentally. 
I mean, I, I understand that, like, we, when we when with that here we're referring to these forces as this attractive phenomenon. There's some sort of attractive phenomena, That's and right. alternatively, you could have a repulsive phenomena. And and it makes a lot of sense to me that, like, if I take a bat and I hit a ball, there's going to be a repulsive phenomenon because one material is pushing the other material out of the way. So the force is push there, and you're hitting the ball, and the ball's moved out of the way. But when it comes to two electrons, what is the force? What what is happening there? Like, are the electrons touching each other? Are, are, are they must be? I mean, I can't. I can't. They're not touching each other. So what is that? Is it magic or something? Like, what is doing that? No, it's a field. A field carries the force. And is the field? The, um, go ahead. It's a field that permeates space time. But the 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 field the electromagnetic field. When you when you drill down to the question of what is a quantum field, a quantum field is a set of vectors that change over time. It's a mathematical quantity that describes attraction and repulsion. That describes attraction and repulsion. And so, to me, it seems like quantum field theory says that mathematics is the fundamental is the is is what the universe is built out of. And that alarms me because there's. Do you know Max Tegmark? Well, you see, it's all based on mathematics. It's a it's a model, <laughs> and the whole of physics is based on this big, big model. Mm. And, the, and mathematics is used to to uh, describe the model. But, but so the mathematics. The what, you what is a mirror? What is a miracle? Is that it works? Well, mathematics because is wonderful, wonderfully descriptive, right? It it, tell, it describes how these quantities change over time. But the thing that it can never do for us is explain, in other words, interpret what what is happening mechanically. Like, what are the actual physical actors doing? Like, I can describe the motion of this cup and the motion of the liquid in it with mathematics, but ultimately. There's atoms that are bumping into each other, and my hands' atoms are displacing the cup's atoms, and it's very simple, right? I'm I'm either pushing on it or I'm pulling on it. Those are really the only two forces at play in my everyday life. It's not like I can do anything else. And so, does it trouble you that we don't spend more time as scientists thinking about what the interpretation of those fine-grained mathematics mean in terms of the structure of the atom or the structure of the electron? Nobody seems to really be working on that. It's like sufficient that we can well, describe the behavior very well. You don't, when you do gravity, when I do my gravity, I don't try to explain what gravity is. Right, that's what I'm talking about. Why is that? Why don't no, people no, worry about that? It, yeah, I know, nobody does. Questions you don't ask in physics. Oh, come on. But I want to ask those <laughs> questions. Those are the, my well, favorite questions. Yeah. Did, Wait, why is physics? Why do you not ask those questions in physics? That seems perplexing to me. Like, if you don't ask them in physics, where else would you ask them? Is that a religious question? Because <laughs> it doesn't get you anywhere. Interesting. Why not? Technologically, perhaps. Well, yes, yeah, so, because this is something that I, I, I've noticed a lot, which is that physics is really good. So, the mathematics of physics is fantastic for engineering. If you want to build something, the mathematics is really good for or being. Or make predictions. Or make predictions. What else? No, that's about it. Yeah, if you want to build things and you want to make predictions, you're going to need mathematics. This is technological engineering side of things. And that's what's super valuable to human race, obviously. So I think you're right that materially explaining what the electrons are physically doing doesn't get you anywhere in terms of technological or predictive power. But I wonder, it is fascinating. And not only is it fascinating, but I wonder if it isn't useful... In ter science is the discipline of, of mechanism, right? It's not just a mathematical description. It, it, I'm a biologist by, by training. And something that the alarmed ATP me... Pump, yeah, exactly. The ATP pump is a great example. So I'm a biologist by training, and I studied metabolism inside of bacterial cells. And metabolism is a fundamentally electrical process. And something that always alarmed me is that the cells are sensing 
charge. They're sensing their their redox state, which is the the balance of reduced species to oxidized species. When you look at the meta- metabolism inside of a mitochondria, you have a proton gradient, and the proton gradient falls through the ATP pump, and it produces ATP by spinning this turbine. But when you get down to it and you ask, what is it about charge that is doing the spinning? How does it spin the thing? Not describe mathematically the curve along which it will spin it, but what are the molecules doing that what actually... What is charge? What is charge? Other than a repulsive effect. The, what causes the repulsive effect? The answer is exactly what you say. It's That's not what we do. And it alarms me because the biologists kick it to the physicists, and they're like, the physicists know the answer to that question. And you go to the physicists, and the physicists also are like, that's not what we do. And so, where do I go, Professor Moffat? Yeah, do we need a new department in the (laughs) academy to study the material interactions of tiny things? Uh, I've done, I've even done solid state physics. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I should say even done, but I, I didn't mean the, the derogatory way. But I, I tend to stick to f- the so-called fundamental physics. But uh, I have published papers on, on the uh, condensed matter physics years ago. Yes. Anyway, um, well. These are difficult questions to answer. Um, well, there might not be answers. I'm just curious if you've thought about it in your career, or if you've encountered others who have thought about it, and if there is a place in the academy for such questions to be asked. Well, the Descartes considered... Uh, no, there was a... The first theory of atoms was by... Um, Thompson, Lord really a Scottish physicist called Tate, and they claimed that atoms were not. Reminds you a bit of string theory, by the way. Mm. And uh, they invented not theory, and they could claim to explain explain some issues of atoms. Then. Uh, Niels Bohr came along, and Rutherford, particularly Rutherford, showed that the consists of the proton, hydrogen atom, the simplest atom, proton, electron, going around. So it's got nothing to do with knot theory, even though knot theory was a very elegant theory. In fact, there's a whole mathematics of knot theory. That's right. Same way can be said about strings. All the elementary particles Actually, strings, like strings on a harp. Except they have no width or, or height. And the problem is it has to be done in 10 dimensions or 11 dimensions. <laughs> and no one's ever detected any spatial dimension above three. So string theory, I, I've worked on string theory some years ago, and I, I decided I didn't like it. I still don't. <laughs> you can't test it. It's, but that's another story. Um, so, uh, yeah, it, 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 there are certain questions you ask in physics which get you to going forward to understand the uh, how particles move with respect to one another, or how forces work and so on. And there are other questions you don't ask, like, what is gravity? Mm-hmm. There have been many papers published in uh, earlier centuries, people trying to explain actually what gravity is. Newton didn't do that. He, he constructed the laws of gravity. He didn't worry about what gravity is. He might have worried a lot, but he didn't publish on it, yeah. Yeah, well, he was into a, a lot of religious activity. And, uh, As was necessary in that day. Being called out of lead or whatever. Alchemy. <laughs> he was a strange man. By the way, he 
he was at my college at Cambridge, Trinity College. That's right. That's right. Many phys- famous physics came from Trinity. Well, Newton really set the stage with that declaration, right? When he when he stated his hypothesis non fingo, he really set up the future of physics for being unconcerned or not having to take responsibility for the material mechanism responsible for the phenomena. It became sufficient to describe what was happening with increasing accuracy and predictive power, and it became less important to explain how it happened materially. And that's That's a really interesting moment in science. That's very strange because you don't get away with that in any other kind of science. Like, I don't, you know, we can't publish in biology leaving out the mechanism for how something happens. We, We have to actually propose some structures that are responsible for the effect, whether it's a neuron or whatever. Or chemistry, too. Or chemistry, yeah. Something has to be responsible for the effect. We can't just say, oh, well, there's signals flowing around in the brain. We have to say, no, the neurons do it, and they do it like this. And everyone points to the physicists. Everyone, when you when you drill down and you you have a theory where the neuron is doing something, and fundamentally the theory of the neuron is charge, because it has action potentials, it's electrical, everything alive is electrical, chemistry is electrical. And then you ask the next question of, okay, it's electrical, what is electricity? What is charge? And the physicists say, well, that's not our bin. Well, the physicists say it's repulsion or attraction. And you say, well, what causes the repulsion or attraction? And they say, well, Newton didn't bother with it, so we don't have to either. Why is it? By the way, speaking of which, do you observe a neuron? I you have, can, yeah. yeah. I mean, you can put there it in a. You can different put it in a. Opinions about that. You can put it in a dish, and you can do a patch clamp experiment where you attach a hollow pipette to the surface of it, and you can read the electrical charge. As as well, some, even one step further, you can measure the calcium influx as the potential happens, right? You can actually use a reporter, a die, from what I... I've never done this, but the guys in the lab next to me in grad school did this all the time. And you can actually watch the the chemistry that leads to the electrical discharge and so on and so forth, which is one step closer to a mechanical explanation. Yeah, you can... They use... Uh, fluorescent reporters, and so as the as the po- electrical potential in the cell changes, the fluorescent reporter glows. And in really simple creatures like hydras that are optically clear, you can actually watch. You can you can touch its little tentacle, and you can watch it spread through the entire organism like the standing wave. You can do this in bacterial colonies. You can do this in plants. I think it's harder to do it in a living, breathing animal, but even then, you have plenty of people that cut up rats and stick electrodes in their brains, and the, and they measure and they they observe. You know, I worked in a laboratory whose goal was to create these neural shanks where you would take a an electrode and you would implant it in the brain, and using that, you would be able to control the behavior of the neurons and read the state of the neurons in an attempt to create an effective, I mean, I don't want to say mind control, but fundamentally, it's, it's brain control. Well, it, it, it gets pretty bad in a way, because take the cork model. Cork says it's now accepted as being part of the standard model. You can never see a cork. Because it's, 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 they're confined, sort of confined. So you can't see them experimentally. But you see an electron. You see an electron in a cathode ray, too. Okay. Also, the quark has fractional charge. Fractional charge, two thirds or one third. So I once uh, invited Marie Gelman, the Bell Prize winner to the University of Toronto for a week in the middle 70s. And we went to lunch. And I said, well, now that you won the Nobel Prize, life must be easier as a physicist when you publish a paper. And he said, 
he was quite a volatile person. He said, absolutely not. I banged his hand against the table. He said, every paper has its problem. He said, take my quarks. I said, okay. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> um, so he had this two-page, three-page paper, small paper called Model of Baryons, Protons. And he submitted to Physical Review Letters. So it consisted of the fact that elementary particles like so-called mesons and protons, protons and neutrons, are made of these fractionally charged quarks. So the Physical Review rejected it. They thought he was a crackpot. But you can't say that Gelman was a crackpot because he's famous. He dominated particle physics. He was a genius. So what do we make about this crackpot idea? So he was very upset. And he phoned the director of theory division at CERN <coughs> called Leon van Hover. At night, <laughs> night for Europe, he says, so Leon says, Mary, what do you want? He says, well, I've got this paper. and I want to submit it to physics letters B. This is the equivalent of physical review letters in Europe. And he was one of the editors. So Leon says, okay, what's it about? It's about these three particles. Three particles here, yeah. up, down, strange quarks. So what? So he said, up, up, down, strange particles. So what's what about the properties? He said, uh, they have fractional electric charge. There's a long silence. <laughs> Did you say fractional charge? <laughs> yes, silence. So what? What do you call them? Quarks. More silence. Quarks? Yeah, three quarks for Mr. Marx, James Joyce. Another long silence. <laughs> so he says, well, Leon, do you think it would be a good idea if I submit this paper? So physics letters B. And Leon was a very conservative Dutch physicist. And uh, he said, no. <laughs> so uh, he went back to his colleagues at CERN and um, they talked about it. And he said, well, you can't reject him because he's, he's Murray Gell. <laughs> he said, yeah, but it's crazy. <laughs> so, okay. So they said, well, you have to accept it. So they accepted it. The rest is history. It took a long time before people would accept the cork idea. Feynman was against it, Richard Feynman, because it fractionally charged corks. So I was a visiting professor at Stanford University for a year. And there was a physicist there who had experiments looking for fractionally charged particles. He had all sorts of weird ways of doing this. And he said, I think I've found fractionally charged particles. Well, that's interesting. Come to my lab. So I spent an hour there looking at this experiment where he thinks he's found fractionally charged particles, fractionally charged quarks. And he said, well, do you believe this? <laughs> well, I agree. Anyway, so this went on. No one ever discovered a fractionally charged particle. They still don't, and they never will. This is outside the box physics. And so what do you make of that? So now, I, I was a bit concerned about it. And uh, I got into arguments with physicists at about that time. 
How can we accept a particle that you can't see? And uh, the people who believe in quotes got angry with me. They said, you're always trying to construct some alternative theory, <laughs> which is true. <laughs> but uh, you see how physics develops. But so if you can't find a fractionally charged particle, and yet the fractionally charged particle is in every single textbook as being part of the fundamental model, how do you reconcile that? How is that different from how is that how is that different from dark matter? Okay. So what happens is you accept this picture and it has experimental consequences. The proton is made of three of these particles, or two of these particles, up to neutron is made of the different combination of charge, fractional charge. You do experiments. You bang protons together at the accelerator, so the Large Hadron Collider, and all sorts of stuff comes pouring out particles. And you do all these precise experiments. And there's no question that the quark model is correct, because there are hundreds of experiments to check it. That was the test. The idea is crazy. Experimental physics eventually shows that this crazy idea is correct. And you can't, you have to use it in particle physics. So I always say in my, one of my quotes, physics is imagination in a straitjacket. <laughs> imagination goes into having an idea outside the box. And the straitjacket, it's experimental data that has to test it. And this right. applies to all of phys physics that I do. I try to keep within the, uh, it's a thin line sometimes between crackpot and reality. Mm. And Miguel Mann was on the thin line. And it, but he was not a crackpot. <laughs> And uh, he had very good reasons for doing what he was doing. You have to have good reasons, and you have to have, have a very good understanding in the basics of what you're doing. And it doesn't hurt to have a good resume, it, it sounds like, also. It seems like having accomplished something great beforehand, like even with Einstein, he had the photoelectric effect before all of this relativity business, right? He, he, had, he had shown something very useful and experimentally valid, and it seems like with the father of quarks, it was the same thing. This guy was already famous for something which was inside of the box. And it seems like with your own work, it's similar too, right? Where we started off, you were, uh, well, you know, before we started recording, you were talking about setting your grad students up with safe projects that, that would teach them the, the fundamentals of physical sciences and experimental work so that maybe they can, and maybe you can, can work on things outside of the box because you have a, a people respect you for being able to work inside of the box. Yes, I can. I have to know to really change a model, a so called standard model, you really have to understand the standard model. And that's where crackpots fail. Yeah. They do not understand the physics. I think you nailed it. Yeah. And I think that that. Important. I think this solves the demarcation problem, right? Because people have argued for decades, if not hundreds, if for a hundred years, of what defines science versus pseudoscience or crack pottery. That's right. And this is the solution. It requires that you have a deep and abiding wealth of knowledge of everything that has come before. And that you've demonstrated that to the community. Yes, yeah, so the community can trust. You have to have trust. That's the difference between someone who's a crackpot and someone who is on the border of... Uh, 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 outside the box. Of outside the box, yeah. That's the difference between outside of the box and crackpot. I think you're exactly right. I think we've solved the demarcation problem, Professor Moffat, so you can add that to your resume. I find that one thing that Fred Hoyle told me that it really 
upset him was refereeing papers because he was full of ideas. A lot of his ideas were outside the box. Einstein was an iconoclast. He always had ideas outside the box, Einstein. That's why he was a great physicist. Um, so, reveries were not kind of oil. And uh, he published a, a, a book, an uh, autobiography called Where the Wind Blows. Very interesting book to read. And uh, he complains about this issue. But this is as it should be. You can't change physics unless there's a good reason to do so. Had Hoyle published a lot inside of mainstream models before that, or was he always outside of the box? No. He was the one who ex uh, explained with others, Burbage, a physicist called Burbage, Cambridge, uh, how Big Bang nucleus, how nucleus synthesis occurred in stars. He's a, this was a great piece of work, a very important piece of work in astronomy and astrophysics. And this led to important conclusions about what's called nuclear synthesis, the uh, making of heavier elements at, in the very early universe. It's called nuclear synthesis, Big Bang nuclear synthesis. So he did a lot of very important work. He was also a very good astronomer. He knew astronomy very well. And uh, he published several important books on astronomy. Um, so, uh, so it seems like the only thing that kept Hoyle down was that his theories weren't checking out with experimental data. They didn't. The, Einstein's theories were not accepted when he put them out. He never won a Nobel Prize for special relativity or, or general relativity. He won it for the photoelectric effect. Because even in 1921, people were doing experiments claiming to prove that special relativity was wrong. And they argued about the existence of the ether way into the 60s, still insisting that maybe the nicholson moore experiment showing the ether didn't exist is, is wrong. After all, it's, a, it's what's called a null experiment. You're only putting a bound on the uh, ether result. You're not proving it's wrong, so to speak. It's just a bound. And you, for more sensitive data, you get better bounds. So, um, uh, do you think that it is the Michelson Morley experiment destroyed the idea of an ether pretty completely? And it, from what I understand, had a chilling effect on physicalism, that there was a physical substance that was responsible for carrying interactions. Right, and, and gravity. Yeah, because electromagnetic waves, sound waves are carried by the air, the medium. So there has to be a medium that carries electromagnetic waves. Otherwise, it wouldn't make any sense. And the, but it turns out that's not correct. So the michelson morley experiment seems like it was searching for an ether that was distinct from the things that are within it. Is It, it was an ether, the, a substance, yeah. like, mm. like dark matter, by the way. <laughs> but it was, and it was, it was distinct from the, the atoms themselves, right? So there was the atoms, right. and then there was a substance, and ether drag would have been detected had the atoms been moving through this substance. But if you look at the visualizations of space-time today, what you see is that it's 
drawn as this filamentary network of interconnections between atoms. So it's almost as if the atom is sitting in this web, and the web appears to be made from the atoms themselves. Is it possible that the connections, and we know that the radial distribution function of an electron extends to infinity. And so is it possible that the extension of the atoms is responsible for their interconnections? Uh, and is it possible well, that the... Of, mm. You can't think of the, uh, the ether as just some... It's not made of molecules. It's, just, of it's, uh, it's like dark matter. There are hundreds hundred different explanations for dark matter. And uh, that's the problem. It's not a unique theory. It's just whatever you can think of. And it can fit anything. I can get dark matter to fit anything. It's so flexible. I think what, what Dr. Benavir is... Do that. Dr. <laughs> I think, Benavir. What, I think <laughs> what Anastasia is saying <laughs> is that the ether of old, the one that was disproven by Michelson Morley, assumes a static background ether among which the objects of the universe unfold. It's a wind. Yeah. A but wind. what if the ether was more like Einstein's kinematic ether? Because when Einstein first came out with general relativity, he described it as a as, as a, a non kinematic sorry, ether. a non kinematic ether, something that respond an ether that responds to the presence of materials of atoms, right? What if, what if we've just completely misconceived of this and this ether is not separate from the atoms, but is actually part of the atoms itself? Therefore, it rearranges. Therefore, there would be no separate wind that is distinct from the objects themselves. If you move the atoms, the ether moves mm. with it. Because as Einstein, as far as I understand from, from everything that I've read by him, he treated space-time as a, as a weird ether. Well, mathematically speaking, but... But did think about this Lorentz, the Dutch physicist. He was the one who understood that Maxwell's equations are invariant under what's called the Lorentz transformations. You do a Lorentz transformation from one inertial frame to another, and the physics stays the same for both frames. Mm -hmm. It's a symmetry. Mm -hmm. So you do the michelson mohr experiment, and you had these uh, interferometer rods, okay? So there's a ether wind. So you're going through the ether, you should be able to detect this wind. But that assumes that the ether is separate from the atoms, right? Like if, if the invariance is interpreted as, oh, well, the atoms are responsible for carrying their own fields with them, their own fields of ether. If all of the atoms have these fields that are moving with them, then the invariance can be explained that way without this separate ether that's just a backdrop. All of a sudden, the backdrop is part of the atoms that are moving in the system. And if the atoms are actually physically connected with one another to produce this, then you don't. Then the ambiguity of what force is disappears, because force is then the connections between the atoms producing the effects that we see. The field is not some magic magic it's it's actually an interconnection between the atoms that uh, that carries electromagnetic radiation because you can block electro you well, can shield electromagnetic radiation what you're explaining is what Lorentz published in, in 1818 1898 and 1903 because he said we have to explain this Michelson ball experiment so what happens is that when there's a a rod going like this, a rod at right angles, because the more experiment moving with the earth. So this, this rod is contracted, you see. If, uh, if the rod, if you explain how the rod is contracted so that the speed of light is not moving at the same speed in each inertial frame, then you can explain away the Michelson Moore experiment. And lo and behold, Lorentz published the papers where he had a theory of electrons, matter, 
atoms, electrons, such that the rod would contract as it moves through space time, space. It's called the Lorentz Fitzgerald contraction factor. And Fitzgerald was a Irish physicist who thought of it independent. And that contraction factor comes into play in the Lorentz transformation. So Lorentz was able to explain away the problem about the ether. Why you didn't see the ether? However, Einstein and Poincaré, also the mathematician, French mathematician Poincaré, preceding Einstein. Einstein came out with a paper, 1905, ignoring Michelson Morley, <coughs> saying the speed of light is the same with respect to all inertial frames. And it turns out that it's a simpler theory. It doesn't disprove Lorentz. It's just simpler. And all these fits all the experimental data. So in the end, the michelson mohr experiment is a null experiment. It, if you expand the powers of, of the velocity of the system divided by velocity of light in powers of V over C, if you go to high, high values of V over C, you start seeing the ether. <laughs> mm. And so the question here then... So you never nullify you never, you never disprove the effort mm. experimentally. It's just that special relativity is a much simpler theory. So if you took, if you took the Lorentz contraction that accounts for the null results of Michelson-Morley and then looked at something like redshift, would you get a different answer for what redshift is? Well, because the atoms arrange themselves so that the rod contracts, you explain why you don't see the ether. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just that it's contrived, complicated. <laughs> mm. And it's far too contrived. It doesn't, it's, you don't want to use it. <laughs> More epicycle. See how it works. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, people people like simplicity, and we, we see this all the time in conversations, especially with physicists, which is that people want to see nature as simple, and the fundamental laws have to be simple, and simple things combined produce complexity. To me, it's that's... Occam's razor. Uh, it, it, to me, it seems a little bit of a flavor. I know that Occam's razor is the standard that, way that people evaluate things, but I'm not... I'm not a hundred percent sure that it that in the entire universe Occam's razor always holds, but it's a good first principle. So I suppose that I agree with you. I'm not entirely in favor of the Occam or using Occam's razor. So I may cut myself. <laughs> uh, I, I, I think the universe is really more complicated. Certainly, life is every day, and biology is. Unendingly complex. It just never ceases to blow my mind. Indeed, Professor Moffat, this we've we've taken almost two hours of your time, and it's been fascinating. Uh, you have you have such a great depth of wisdom and insight onto the arc of physics that is absolutely invaluable. By the way, I forgot to mention. Regarding the speed of light, I published a paper not long ago where I compared all the experimental predictions of inflation I compared them to similar predictions for me, and they agree. There's no way at present to say which theory is correct. But sociology comes in, and inflation is the more popular explanation. So I just have to accept that. But there are still papers published on, on, on my paper. In fact, a paper just came out a few days ago referring to my papers from 1991. Well, that's what's fascinating is that science really wants a single answer. 
we need headlines. We want to have textbooks. We want to be able to say, stand up in front of the first year students and say, this is how it works. And we don't want to say, well, there's all these different possible theories. That's very unsettling for some reason. Did you ever watch Carl Sagan's Cosmos? Sorry. There was a there was a TV program, I think it was in the 80s, it was called Cosmos, hosted by Carl Sagan. Yes. Did you ever watch it? Uh, I don't know. I, it's... Yes. I mean, the, the, the details of it are, are insignificant for the example that I want to use, but we're watching it right now to get a sense of, of, of its power because it's such a cultural phenomenon that has held since it was published. And what's amazing is how discreet, clear, and final the story is that is being told. It is presented as the story. And even now you hear people say things about how the universe works and it's clear that what they're doing is they're repeating the words of Carl Sagan because that program had such a fundamental hold on the collective imagination. And it's very hard to create something that is both paradigm shifting and sufficiently charming to lodge itself in the heart of everyone who wants to know how things work. And that, I think, is the greatest challenge beyond simply coming up with an idea that can shift the paradigm. It's the ability to fit it into a story with such certainty that you can go out and say, this is how it is. And the more that we find out, the harder it is to be able to say that this is how it is because the era of these big, simple theories seems to be almost behind us. And the future appears to be a field of special cases. Well, I would say that when we have ideas in physics, around 98% of them fail. Over the last 100, 200 years, there are very few laws of physics, so to speak, that have been able to hold up. So you had Karen with two hands, two fingers, hands and fingers. And uh, this is why I went into physics, because I found it extraordinarily challenging intellectually. It's very difficult to do. It's very hard to get an idea and test it experimentally and show that it's, it's correct and that it, it moved physics in a significant way. It's one of the most difficult things to do. Well, that sounds like an admirable goal then. Mm. And yeah, I, it seems like there's a lot of work to be done. And it seems like you have... You have put a lot of ideas into the world that have that have done so and so you've given great grist let's hope some of them are right oh indeed indeed you've given great grist for the mill so thank you for that thank you it's been a pleasure. by the way um when what happens now with this <laughs> Uh, we uh, will probably we have to edit it a little bit because we had some audio problems at the beginning. Yeah, we we only are able to release one of these episodes every week right now, so we have a number of them that we've recorded. We are going to be traveling this winter, so we store them and we we release them as we go. So this will probably not be published for a little while. I actually don't know. We haven't determined the calendar. Yeah. Um. It might maybe it should go out sooner because the James Webb stuff is so hot and everything. Yeah. But yeah, we'll we'll send you an email um, once it's ready. Um, but it, it, I'm not sure how quickly that will be. But it's been a really good conversation. I think there's some great stuff in here. People, uh, our, our audience will really enjoy it. We just need to uh, maybe trim off the beginning and a couple of these pauses. But mm -hmm. yeah, I think it's been a really wonderful conversation. So you let me know. Absolutely. Yeah, of course. And then if you. Yeah, if you if you find yourself waking up in the middle of the night and you'd like to call us and and talk more about ideas, we're here for you. Oh dear. 
Are you sure you want this? <laughs> Absolutely. It, no, it's so. I, I it's really. Like Mary Gellman. <laughs> exactly. Tony. I mean, it's been really. It's a sun. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Middle of the night. Exactly. And I promise I. I promise I won't do that. <laughs> well, it's good. We have a, we've made friends with a few of the guests, and they do call us, and and we we have had longer relationships, <laughs> believe it or not. Um, I think so, that there's yeah. not a lot of places where we can where people can talk about these sorts of ideas and and have the freedom to to play. And so it's I re I'm really grateful that you're interested in playing and your 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 mind is so open and so focused on understanding and it's. It's it's such a pleasure. Uh, so, by the way, I thank you for all your good questions. You you do a really good job of interviewing. Thank you.